They weren't take lightly, they were part of a lavish entertainment in the company of sometimes hobby horses, bull baiting and dancing bears. In 100 Years, 100 Objects, stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums, we're delving into the collections to discover objects that can tell us stories about the past and make us think about the present and the future. I'm Millie Wellborn, Museum Assistant at Lancaster City Museums. In this episode, we are looking at an object which depicts a practice which is familiar to most people who live in the UK, but it is in a form which might not be quite so familiar. Today's object is a wooden panel which shows a group of Morris dancers. The panel is carved in oak with no colouring. It is 69 centimetres long and 15 centimetres tall. Along the panel, there are seven figures in an array of poses and a variety of costumes. Some of them carry musical instruments. This is a depiction of a form of folk dancing, which was the predecessor to our modern day Morris dancing. We spoke to Andy Hornby, a former museum employee who has worked with the panel and is a key musician himself to find out more about it. We were also joined by Bob Tyson, who was on hand with his pipe and tabber. It came from Lancaster Castle. I think it's more likely to have come from a piece of furniture, like a coffered chest or something, rather than wall panelling. The Victorian Albert Museum dated it from the mid to late 1500s. Queen Elizabeth was known to have refurbished parts of the castle in the 1580s, so it could have gone in then. It's speculation. There's seven characters on it. The style of the of the carving of the characters... It's pretty certain that they were copied from a stained glass window in the Victorian Albert Museum from Betley in Staffordshire that has very similar figures. And in turn, it's thought that those designs for the stained glass window came from a design engraving by a German engraver called Israel van Mechenem, which was about 1490. Prints of that engraving are fairly common across Europe, so it will have been known. Next, Andy took us through the first few figures that can be seen on the panel. The first one, there's a a male dancer dressed as a woman, wearing a knee-length full skirt with tight bodice and a fancy hat, looking rather like a pantomime dame, holding a ladle or maybe a cup for collecting money. The groups of what were called the Moresque groups or the Morisco groups, they had certain characters and the fool was one and obviously they had a musician and the female figure was often known as Maid Marian. Maid Marian predates Robin Hood. I know we associate her with Robin Hood, but she's older and she's she was a shepherdess and a figure of sort of the spring. She wasn't a dancer. She would have gone round the audience and collecting money. You still find uh, female figures in Morris dancing occasionally called the Betty or the Molly, which brings us to the second figure, which is the Tabra. He's wearing a cloak and a feathered cap. With his right hand, he's playing a long pipe, a bit like a recorder, but it's only got three holes. And with his left hand, he beats a small drum that's suspended from a cord around his right wrist. So he's a one-man band. He's playing the two instruments together. The pipe and tab were the original one-man band and uh, a common instrument from the Middle Ages, probably up to the 1800s. In Carlisle Cathedral, there's a pillar and there's two characters carved on the top. This is a Norman cathedral, so we're talking about the 1100s. And there's a pipe and tabard player and next to him is is an acrobatic dancer. So there's a long tradition of of this instrument. The reason for the three finger holes is that you don't play the bottom octave, you play the first octave. Can you just demonstrate, Bob? Yeah. Okay. So you start on the first octave. By the time you've got three fingers up... You put your fingers down and blow again and you get the next note in the scale. So with one hand you can play a full octave and a half. The pipe that he's playing on the panel is about the length of the one that Bob's playing here. It's about 40 centimetres long and it plays the note G. The third figure on the panel appears to be wearing a costume which includes a pair of fake breasts. We wanted to know more about who this figure and the others on the panel could have been. It was known in mystery plays and things like that for characters to be representing Adam and Eve and to be dressed up wearing kind of net and presumably fake accoutrements. So 
I don't know. It's I've not come across that character generally in those groups, but th- they were there for kind of entertainment, and uh, I'm sure that the audience would have found that quite amusing. The fourth, fifth, and the sixth characters are general dancers. I mean, they would have been the main show. They're wearing hats and short tunics, knee breeches and bells attached. On the right there looks like a jester. He's got a cap on with bells and he's carrying a bladder on a stick. And at the back of his coat he seems to have a tail as part of his jacket. I've come across records of fools wearing calves' tails and sometimes having them on the end of a stick and hitting people with it. The role of the jester was really to kind of interrupt the proceedings and make it all a bit unpredictable, a bit anarchic, I suppose. He'd have danced in and around the dancers trying to disrupt them and probably hitting them with his bladder. And what about the music that these figures would have been dancing to? Andy explained the history of some of the instruments and tunes which Bob demonstrated for us. English folk dance music wasn't really written down much in the 1500s, but on the continent it was. There was a book from France called Orchisography, and a lot of the tunes in that are very very common across Europe, and musicians travel and they swap tunes. It's something we do all the time. So until John... Playford published English Dancing Master in 1651. There weren't many collections of English folk dance music. So we're going to ask Bob to play a couple of tunes from Orchisography, and the first one is La Moresque. <laughs> There's another one in that book, and it's called the uh, the Brawl des Cos, the Scottish <coughs> Brawl, which I don't know if it's from Scotland or whether it was done in a style that they thought sounded Scottish, because that happens. <laughs> Yeah, I mentioned John Playford's book, 1651, Cromwell was still in control. And it's often thought that he just banned all dancing and everything. But it it did happen. In fact, Cromwell's own daughter got married and they had dancing and music. Playford's book was published every year until the 1720s. So that's hundreds and hundreds of tunes. It's the biggest collection of our national folk music. We have referred to the figures on this panel several times already as Morris dancers, and most people in the UK will know what this term means. But where did it come from? On the continent in Europe, just about every country has an equivalent of Morisk, Morisco, come across versions in the Low Countries, in Holland, even Eastern Europe, in Croatia. It refers to the Moors of Morocco, and the Morisco groups were... It meant exotic. It was kind of, they wore bright costumes and bells and feathers and they made a lot of noise. And their dancing would be very sort of extreme. It would be acrobatic and more about striking strange poses than Morris dancing as we know it today. Folly, uninhibitedness. So it was there. It was a bit risky, a bit edgy as an entertainment. I suppose it was on a level with the travelling players, mummers' plays, the mystery plays, things like that. The, the groups of dancers were professionals. This was their job. They travelled around and they would be hired by different groups. We've got a few records. In 1448, records of the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths show that dancers and musicians were paid for their annual feast on St Dunstan's Day. Twelve hats for minstrels, ten shillings. For their drink, twenty pence. A harper was 12 pence, a piper, that would be a bagpiper, 2 pence. The Morris dancers were 7 shillings, so they were paid quite a lot. I mean, the costumes were quite expensive. They were satin and brightly coloured and the dyes were expensive. And then in 1477, the Worshipful Company of Drapers paid 28 shillings for the Morris dancers. 
So they weren't taken lightly. They were they were part of a lavish entertainment in the company of sometimes hobby horses, bull baiting, and dancing bears. Uh, they were even engaged at the royal court in 1580. Robert Langham described the visit of Queen Elizabeth to Kenilworth. The entertainments provided for her included a lively Morris dance, according to the ancient manner. Six dancers made Marion and the fool, which sounds very much like our group. To finish our entertainments today. Andy explained how the Morisco groups of the 1500s became the Morris dancers we know today. Similar groups that weren't professional would have danced at village fairs, at May Day events and things like that. So gradually it came out into the community rather than being uh, paid entertainment for the aristocracy. The church wasn't quite so happy all the time. In Canterbury on the 10th of May 1589, a group of Morris dancers, they made the mistake of dancing against the mayor's door. And then it describes the group, four male dancers, a boy dressed as Maid Marion, the leader of the side also played the fool, and they had a fiddler, not a pipe and tabla, and eventually that became probably the main instrument until the invention of concertinas and squeeze boxes. They danced on May Day and again on the Sunday. So they hired the fiddler, they didn't have their own fiddler, and they kept the fiddler for about a week. They gave him, they kind of danced every day leading up to Easter. A lot of the records that we have of Morris dancing come from complaints in parish records. In 1633, the northernmost record of Morris dancing in England was at Hornby in Lancashire. The church officials were complaining against the dancers carrying out traditional rush bearing for profaning the Sabbath with Morris dances and great fooleries, their lord of misrule and their clowns carrying crosses and crucifixes, marching like warriors with long stave pikes, shooting with guns and muskets. It was possible that they stole the crosses and crucifixes from the church without authority. So with the exception of Hornby, evidence of Morris dancing before the Restoration really was confined to a line from the Mersey to the Wash. So it's, it's a southern English thing. I came across a picture dated 1650 of a Morris dancer wearing pretty much what you'd expect them to wear today, with these carrying handkerchiefs, crossed sashes that they wear across their shirt, or usually with a waistcoat as well, and they're called baldricks. He has a lot of bells that are tied to his, his shins. After the Civil War, the parliamentarians associated Morris dancing with disorder, drunkenness and royalist sympathies. In 1654, the Commonwealth Parliament passed an ordinance for forbidding the encouragement and countenance by word or practice of wits and ales, wakes, Morris dances, maypoles, stage plays or such licentious practices. With the restoration in 1660, Charles II was encouraged to bring back country recreations such as May games, Morris dances, Lords and Ladies of the May, the Fool and the Hobby Horse. The Duke of Northumberland advised Charles that the country people should trip on the town green about the maypole to the loud bagpipe, there to be refreshed with their cakes and ale. Such diversions will amuse the people's thoughts and keep them in harmless action, which will free your majesty from faction and rebellion. For the King's coronation there was Morris dancing and a maypole in the Strand. In Cheltenham Museum there's a painting from about 1715, and it shows a Morris side, as they're called, Pretty much exactly what you'd expect today. They're wearing white shirts and baldricks and carrying handkerchiefs. Perhaps the 18th century was the heyday of the Morris, the familiar handkerchief dance mostly associated with Oxford and the Cotswolds. Several variants developed along the Welsh borders. They danced with big sticks and that became known as Border Morris and it still is today. In the northwest, Morris dancing was more associated with the wakes, rush bearings and the rush cart processions that still go on today. In the mid-19th century, there was a bit of a decline in the Morris. It still carried on. It carried right on up to probably the First World War. Some of the reasons for that decline, the Industrial Revolution, there was a depopulation of the countryside, so people were moving into towns to work in factories, but also the coming of the railways Rather than go to a a village fete, they could get on a train and go to the seaside. And also there was a rise in non-conformist religious groups like the Methodists. And they didn't really approve of the association with alcohol and begging as well. So in 1899, the renowned folk song collector Cecil Sharp, he encountered the Headington Quarry Morris and their musician William Kimber. Sharp's interest was mostly in collecting the tunes that he was playing. He wasn't very interested at that point in the dances, but he wanted to save the tunes because he could see that 
the new musicians weren't learning these. He was worried about the loss of the whole tradition. He set about travelling the country and collecting dances. And so he was kind of responsible for not just the continuation of the tradition, but a massive growth in the tradition. And there are you know, there's very few towns that don't have a Morris team. Even across the world, you know, you find Morris dancers in Australia and America. I suppose one of Cecil Sharp's main achievements was the creation of the English Folk Song and Dance Society, which has its headquarters in London at Cecil Sharp House. And it's still the focus of Morris dancing traditions today. Thank you so much for taking a dance through history with us. We hope you will enjoy some of our other episodes where we talk about objects from tombstones to tide tables.